Hello, welcome to Mark Langley's Horsemanship Podcast, a podcast helping people to understand their horses better, to provide solutions in a calm, connected way. I'm Jenny Barnes. And I'm Mark Langley. Hi, Mark, and we're talking to you from Florida in the States. How are you going over there? Yeah, yeah, really well. I'm at a little place called Okeechobee. It's, it's a nice place that's out of the way. Um, yeah, on some backcountry dirt roads. They're more like sand roads around here, but um, but yeah, beautiful little spot. And I'm on a, on a, a cattle ranch here uh, where I've done a, yeah, just done a three-day clinic and yeah, just had a day having to look around some of the other cattle properties here and trying to find some alligators in the dams, but <laughs> didn't find any. So You wouldn't think there'd be too many cattle properties in Florida? Yeah, well, once upon a time when I first came to Florida, I knew there was a lot of citrus and stuff like that. But uh, um, the the people I'm staying with, um, the husband, he's a uh, he, he's a local of Florida all his life, and his um, his grandparents were were, were farmers in Florida, uh, growing a lot of all sorts of things from citrus to uh, they call them bell peppers, but I think it's green peppers like the um, um, capsicums and uh, all sorts of things and uh, and they're, ca- they're cattle farmers here but yeah there's a lot there's a lot of cattle farms and yeah all sorts of farming there's dairies up the road but um yeah it, there's quite a part of florida that's actually you know nice and sort of country and remote from from the rest of the florida like the miami and orlando that people sort of know of yeah and tell me how are the people in america taking your horsemanship how are you finding that you fit into their kind of like um you know what they've normally seen and done over there um really well actually the whole way through um you know i've got a sense that the the people that i've helped have have uh, really found it well partly unique but um They've sort of tried anything, everything, and 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 this has been a real eye opener. And they've and I think they've gone home with some some really good new ideas to help their horses. And some uh, have gone home, uh, like a lady who just left the last clinic. She said, "I wish I met you eight years ago." Uh, and she's done a lot with with a horse that was a troubled horse. And and um, I, I think she was so excited to get some new information, refreshed refreshed information to help this little troubled horse that she had. So. It's been nice to, to get such a positive response because, um, you know, coming out of Australia, you know, you'd think just about everyone in horsemanship or whatever has done something over here. But, um, but yeah, I've, I've really shown some people some different ideas and, and, and those, they, they've had some good results and, um, you know, through the clinic in, in implementing, implementing those things. And, um, and like, like our little saying is, uh, I think I've got a lot of people to scratch their head and look through a different lens. So, um, and though some people, like uh, a, a few of the fence sitters and a few of the people on the clinic say, oh, I'm cooked at the end of the day <laughs> with all the information and new information they all had the to process. So, um, yeah, and yeah, lots of note takers, which was great. It's great to see people with their pens out. And um, it's funny, I was reading some notes, just getting some ideas of uh, the lady who's hosted me here, Stephanie, and uh, I just went through a notebook just to get some ideas of my, because at the end of the day, sometimes I'm cooked and I can't remember anything I taught. So, um, <laughs> so um, I, I, uh, I was looking at her notes and it was funny reading the notes in quick jot form because, um, you know, her interpretation of what I said through the day. And, and if, the, if, if, if um, I'm not, I'm sure most people enjoyed the horsemanship, but the, but if I failed on the horsemanship front, they, they, they all, I think, enjoyed the, the Australian humour, which was good. <laughs> Oh, there's always the humour side of it. Good to hear. No, I'm yeah. pleased that pleased that um, you know you're able to help all those horses over there and show people you know the, the, the tricks and your um the, your magic that you're able to do with horses. We've got some great horse related training problems and questions for you today. I'm really excited to do this podcast. It's just um, there's some really interesting questions that have come through from our members. Um, from a horse that won't take a step backwards to a horse that runs back to the barn and a rescued horse that randomly strikes. So um, we'll get stuck into it to see um, what your answers are on some of these. Now, a couple of years ago, you worked in Finland and you helped a bunch of people over there. One of them was a lady called Anu, who at that time had a nervous and shut down Icelandic pony. She now has him much more relaxed on the ground, but she's finding that now he's opened up, he's expressing his own will and opinions, and he's quite stubborn. Is that quite normal for horses that have been shut down previously that they sort of go through that stubborn phase when they open up because all of a sudden they're they're that kid that can go yeah they have an opinion 
Yeah, so so um, horses come out differently. Um, I find some of the stoic sort of horses, the the shut down sort of some of the colder blooded shut down ones and stuff like that, the ones that were sort of a shut down and heavy horse that that sort of internalises. Some of those ones come out, and because they weren't sort of, I guess they're not aware and learning when they're shut down as well as they could. Um, then obviously they're pushing boundaries and they've got ideas, but they've never learned about boundaries because uh, uh, their, their awareness is not sort of in the right state to be aware of us when they were shut down. So they, they weren't le- learning about our, um, you know, where we are and, and, um, and, and just the boundaries, the boundary of a rope or the boundary of we're standing in front of you and you don't have to push through us and things like that. So, so they come out and, and they're just like a young horse, like, I wouldn't say a young horse, but they're a bit like a young horse that's sort of testing everything. Um, their anxiety comes out because some horses that are that are really shut down, they've kind of got a lot of worry inside them and, and it and it comes out. And I get a lot of horses like, you know, ex-performance reigning style horses that people buy thinking they're going to have some cream puff trail riding horse because it's sort of been all to all these reigning events and, um, you know, competed and, and it you know, they think it's kind of, bomb proof but in two weeks it it is a bomb um and and because the horse was just so robotic and over focused on pressure that when they go on a trail ride and all of a sudden there's all these horses and environment to process and the, and the horse suddenly realizes that it doesn't have to hyper focus and not think about everything and because it's not been thinking about anything they can become super explosive um and more explosive than 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 sometimes the off the track race horse that sort of that you think would be the really explosive one. So, uh, yeah, it's, and it's really hard because you, when you're teaching clinics, you're, you're really trying to help people understand that they need to get ho- the horse out of that shutdown uh, and you got, you know, state. But the the challenging piece of it is, is it's a, it's, it's it's not the luck of the draw. There's certain types of horses that come out of a shutout phase that soften and they just look amazing. Like the horse at this, this last clinic, it was a really shut out thoroughbred uh so when it goes into your environment it just gazes off and it's just completely frozen and you know the airways are chuffy and um you know like makes a <coughs> funny noise in the airways but it's more of a, a, a chronic freeze but on the last lesson when it rode it it, it looked amazing in it's in its in its um the pro being able to process her her feel her her ideas and also and just take on the environment that was riding around so you know it, it was so sensitive that it was really soft but then in Annie's case, by the sounds of it, the horse is coming out and uh, not soft. It's just kind of, you know, got a strong ideas and a very strong intention. Okay, so this particular horse that um, Annie's got, I'll read you what her question is in particular. Cause so he was a little bit shut down, but now she's riding him and he, she's finding that he is resisting the reins. If she wants to turn to the right, he will stiffen his neck and bite the bit. He's very strong and he almost yanks the reins from her. It seems like he just wants to go where he wants to go. He'll try the one rein start, but he's very reluctant in moving forward. Or if she tries to move one leg, that's all he will do. If she tries to put him in reverse, then he will, and I'm not quite sure what she means, he stumps his front legs very strongly on the ground. So the ground starts to spin around his front legs. Um, and so she can see that he's expressing his own will and opinions, but she's not getting any luck in actually getting him to do what she wants him to do. Yeah, the hard thing about it is is um, he's going to require, you know, uh, a boundary that's very clear and it might take him a few goes, but, but he's got to sort of really let go of those sort of those strong um, long thoughts. And what I mean by a long thought, it's like a long thought is when my mates are over there and my mind's over there and my body's got to get there. Uh, their mind's not here. So basically that thought, that body is pushing that strong thought. And because he's been shut down, the pressure that's been applied when he was shut down, he wasn't really taking on board that well. So it's a whole new learning thing for him. So, um, you know, really, like I was just thinking about the question when I read it and I thought something I would probably do with a horse like him, a little stoic horse that can really push pressure is I would uh, do two things I would sort of look at doing first. One of them would be um, getting him to see, uh, so working on his eyes in the sense that, okay, here's pressure in front of you. Can you move away from that? And some people may think that's 
driving pressure and think, oh, Mark doesn't do driving pressure. Well, it's it's not you driving him, chasing him around and sending him on circles. It's just, uh, for instance, getting a flag in front of him and shaking it until he goes, oh, I don't like that, I might step back and, and, and get his awareness up that he can actually move away from the things he sees. And then when you walk around with him, uh, if you stop and he keeps kind of pushing through you, you can wave that flag and say, hey, I'm here. And he goes, oh, there's something in front of me, I better move back. And what that does is it snaps his thoughts out of looking through you or ahead and then he sort of steps back and, and, and becomes more present. And I think with those horses, sometimes you've just got to start off with getting their eyes to tell their mind to make a good decision. So obviously the, the eyes are the window to the brain. Um, so basically he makes decisions on what he sees and, and starts to learn that we have space that we're, uh, that, 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 that's valuable to us. And, and you say, you know, maybe it might be uh, a metre, like three feet, uh, and I don't, I don't want you to walk into that space. I want you to just be aware of where I am, where I'm going, if I'm stopping, if I'm backing. And that starts to get them to think and actually get in that um, answering question type of mindset. And then when you go to picking up a lead rope and backing them, doing things like that, they're already starting to be a little bit softer in their decision making. Uh, and they're starting to answer questions, not just um, act on every impulse that they have. And then you go to sort of picking up a rope and teaching them. But I was thinking with, with him, if you, if you find that it's a bit of trouble under saddle, a horse has got really strong forward and they're really sticky in the feet, I tend to put them in the long reins. And the long reining lessons I do is basically put a, put a halter on them, two long reins, and, and go around them with the long reins and I'll walk around them. You have to, you have to practice this and watch some of the long reining videos, but, um, and get them to loosen up their hind feet and their front feet and turn around inside the reins and go the other way, turn around inside the reins. And then when you back up, you put a bit of feel in the reins. And if he kind of starts to feel the lean, so you're not going to attack him with the reins and go in straight, straight hard straight away. You're just going to take some feel. But if you feel him look through the reins and start to lean and start to sort of phase out or whatever, well, you sit on those reins, not sit on them, but, you know, dig your heels into the ground and pull and say that's not available. And if he takes one step back, you just like lighten and just say, I only want you to stop pushing. And and you're not, you're not going to ask him to back up a, a whole long way or anything like that. You're just going to say stop pushing. And when he stops pushing, then you can start to say, now let's back up. And, and I would keep him in the long reins for some time, like so many days, until... You can, you can back him and you can circle while you're backing and he just stays loose in the reins and he's really loose and, and he's yielding off that pressure a lot better. And then in a safe area, if you're used to riding him in a bit, I would, I would put the holder on and I would go into teaching him how to back up first before you even work on the turns because back up is him yielding the two reins, backing up and loosening all four feet and, and taking that, pre, that push out of him. Uh, and in the process of doing the long crane reining, you're actually getting to do those hind quarter yields and free up in the hind feet as well. So when you start to use indirect rein pressure, he's going to be more like, uh, more able to bend and release his feet. Um, and when you're doing the turnarounds in the long reins, make sure you try and draw some bend into him. So he's bending and moving inside those long reins around, around, around. Um, and just do that and don't let him go forward for like some time, I just say stop pushing, back up, move around inside the reins until he's really loose and he's really uh, comfortable in there and he's, and he's flowing. And then you'll start to get backups that you could do for 20 metres and he's just flowing backwards with a nice two-beat rhythm. And then you start to think about riding him. But it's basically kind of like a restart for him because he's just a, like a pony that's learnt to lean and push into the reins. He just needs to learn that that's not available. Right, so now that he's in a different mindset, you're actually redoing the training because he's going to take it in in a different way as well as you showing him a different way. So there's mm -hmm. two things happening there, isn't there? Yeah. Yeah, great. Okay. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, I'm going to move on to the next question, which is from Stephanie from Australia. Um, so I'm not quite – this is the horse that rears, and it's, it's a really challenging um, situation that she's got, and I'm, I really hope that you can help her. Um so he is a rescue thoroughbred that he's that she's helping with the training. He's a tricky guy. He's gone through six homes in the last two years. Um, he's been sort of put on the shortlist to 
um, be put down several times, but she's sort of come along and stepped in and said, no, let's just give him one last chance. And it really sounds like it is the last chance. Um, so the lady who's rescued him got him as a horse for her 12 year old daughter because he rarely shows this dangerous behavior we're going to talk about in a second. He's quite a happy paddock pony. But when he's asked to do something, even as simple as rugging, if he doesn't want to do it, he'll rear and strike. Um, so he can have quite dangerous outbursts. And she's found that, um, you know, they were just talking one day and all of a sudden he just um, stood up on his back legs and struck. Apparently there was a argument happening between his previous owner, who's a wife and a husband, and he actually knocked the husband down. Um, so I'm painting a picture of quite an explosive horse. So what Stephanie's done is she's come on board. She's come to your membership to try and sort of see if she can work a way of helping him. She's looked at the videos on the explosive behavior that you've got there. And she's found that the only thing that will somewhat heighten him is her yelling. Um, she's found that if they lead him out and work with him away um, from the yards. Again, that's a trigger for wearing and striking. She's had um, him body worked by a chiropractor, um, but she's just interested in your opinion on how you would go about addressing him. Um, in her mind, she thinks that maybe he's been over desensitized and not allowed to have his own opinion and flips if, when he does. Um, so yeah. Um, he has severe anxiety, he tongue chews, he self-soothes, uh, he has limited feeling in his nose, sometimes requires a stallion chain to be handled. So what are her best um, sort of tactics, Mark, to proceed with this horse? On a, on a positive note, well, it's not positive because you, there's a lot of them out there. I, I come across this, this problem a lot, um, I guess. Uh, the only reason that's positive is because you're probably not not the only one out there, and um, it is a fixable thing. Uh, it's not like doom and it's not it, it well, it's not it's not necessarily doom and gloom, but it's not easy either to 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 address. And just just in this last clinic, I had a a big warm blood. He was an imported European warm blood, and you know the process of being born in another country and however he was brought up over there and coming to America and different things. And he was at a stage that he was running off and aggressive and, and strike like at kind of half attacking people and striking at them. And then the way he presented at this clinic was a bit more of a shut down horse that sometimes runs, runs, runs off. Um, and he, he was quite dull in a certain respect. And this is what they go into. They go into kind of a dull state. Um, but you kind of know that right. that's, and that something else is still inside them. Uh, and this horse actually, you know, like he, he jumped on top of her to mount her. That's how kind of, what sort of horse he was and that, and, and massive big warm blood. So you can imagine, you know, a huge horse like that coming at you like that's quite, quite scary. So, so he's got all these mixed emotions of being a horse around people, but, you know, he doesn't, you know, and then bubbling inside him and with lack of clarity, lack of boundaries, lack of mental and physical mobility, they just become, you know, they just don't know what to do and uh, they don't know they, they have anxiety they don't know what to do with it they haven't grown up in a big paddock that had that freedom of movement and interaction that kind of helps them be able to adjust around anxieties and different energies of horses and same things like that and so they haven't gone through that whole process so um so there's this there's this whole bunch of stuff in there and um and it's it, it can be quite scary and it's sometimes the ones that they end up getting flooded, like you know, like, like you might have mentioned, you know, like you mentioned in the question, you know, probably desensitised, and then they become desensitised, but then everything just internalises, and they kind of go into this kind of dull state. And when you say that he's not um, moving backwards off your know, nose pressure, he feels very dead, and you feel like you need a stallion holder on him. Well, that's the common thing I see it. You know, not to criticise dressage and and stuff but you hear about a lot of dressage competitions you, you get a horse that can be ridden in the ring but then they, they put a stallion bridle on it just to lead it from the ring to the, wherever they got to go um but it's um what you need to give him back is the ability to think and act uh, around 
pressure and stimulant. So you have to undo the, the desensitizing and give him um, a, 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 I'm trying to think of the right word. I don't want people to think a flight response like run away, but access to being able, I can move away from things if I want. I don't have to be here. I don't have to put up with this and then attack at the people who have kind of come at me all the time because you can imagine people have come at him, done things to him, all this sort of stuff. And so basically he feels like he's backed into a corner, frozen, and at the slightest pop or the slightest shout or something, he's kind of goes straight to de defensive. Um, and how you get a horse out of defensive is saying if you're concerned about that, well, you could always move away but they feel like they can't move away because they're so frozen and, and their mind and their body and that proprioception is just not working at all. They just can't access movement and they don't think they can actually, you know, they're not, they're not allowed. They think they're not allowed to do it, but it's all, it's not, not that they think that they're not allowed. They probably originally thought that they weren't allowed, but then it became, I'm just frozen and I can't until it's too much pressure and they attack. So, uh, just thinking about the question and how I'd sort of deal with it, the, 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 the thing that I do mostly when I'm dealing with those type of horses is I I have to bother them in some some way to create a little bit of that I'm not sure what to do and get them to move away from the danger. So usually I just put a flag in front of them or do something, but by the sounds of it, um, he's... Uh, you know, a bit dead to the flag. And I don't want to encourage you to get super big with the flag and then suddenly he lunges at you. So it's, there's a fine line in this. And, and I don't want you to go poking him around with sticks to move him around because that will make him kick and get very irritated if he's like that and start to really come at you with pressure. So I'm kind of thinking whether you clap, whether you do something, you have to do something, even if you had a flag on a long, a long stick, like a very long stick, that you could stand away from him for a bit and you're completely neutral. You might even, you know, have a long rope on him too so he just doesn't run around like in a round yard or something because maybe he's been round pen and if he does start to go, he might just run around. So that's not going to help either. Um, I mean, I may do it, but I'll know exactly what to do when he runs around. I don't want to put you in a situation where he's running and you feel a bit helpless to stop him. So I, I'd probably... Have so she mentioned in that that she raised her voice. What about is is raising your voice? Because because I know a part a lot of what you uh, what you teach is that we're not pushing our emotions onto the horse. We're not pushing us into them. So this is really important in establishing boundaries. You're asking them to do something quite specific. So um, you know if, if we can't if you don't want her to use a stick for that reason, what about projecting your voice? Is that pushing your boundary onto them? You know if you get sort of quite loud with your voice. To, to be honest, uh, as long as your body language is calm and you're not coming at the horse and doing stuff on him and at him, all you have to do is create something that gets him to trigger a search response in him or an uncomfortable response, and then that response has got to turn into an action. Um, and that action preferably will be, I might just move a little bit away from this spot. Um, and and that is the best thing that I just keep doing that with them until when they're bothered a little bit by something, instead of freezing and feeling helpless, they go, well, I'm just going to move away from it. And then they go over there and they breathe and they go, I just saved my own life. I'm a, I'm a hero. And they feel good because they've just done something for themselves. So so um, what I would probably do is um, like sometimes I'll do a, a sharp kiss, like a, like a real sharp one like that, as I pop a flag on the ground. Um, so it makes a noise and a sharp noise and it kind of triggers a bit of a twitchy response in the horse and then you just stand back and let them do something like you're hoping you're far enough away that you're not and you're out you you'll be as calm as a cucumber you'll be just standing there like you like you're just you know reading the paper or something uh, and you might have a long stick with a flag on it and you might bang the ground kind of in front of him somewhere and make a sharp kiss and he's going to go oh and he's going to get a little spook and then he might move a bit and then he'll lick and chew or something because he just came out of that freeze for a moment. And But you're far enough away that you're not pushing your energy, you're not projecting at him, you're not doing anything. So he just moved away from the initial threat, which could have been that plastic bag on a stick, okay? And he kind of releases some of that tension and he does something for himself. And, uh, and I would carefully somehow set up a situation like that where I could create a, a neutral kind of 
worry that he just goes, oh, oh, what's that? I just might move a bit. And then, and then he starts to process and think and start to look. And then you can, as you're moving the flag around, you'll see him watching and sort of thinking about moving. And, um, and, and usually it's, it, it's a, it just gets him out of that frozen state of helplessness. Um, and the other thing, you know, there's, there's those months and months of just going out, being a bit softer in the paddock with him and just going up slowly to him. And so you're not, you know, at a clinic, I would probably show him big energy, but I wouldn't tell you to do it over a podcast or, or something like this in case I gave you the wrong decision. Um, and, and that's why I'm also saying what I'm telling you do with caution as well, because, you know, I may choose something slightly different, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking that's something I would do with him. I, I, I just get him to sort of just move from, from that danger and then, when you approach him in the paddock and stuff like that, just wait a little while on him and just, just wait a bit, wait till he softens a bit, then just walk up to him, touch and go, leave him alone and spend more time just in and out and in and out um, with him. So it's not just, oh, here comes the person, here comes the holder, freeze, I'm, I'm, I'm in that emotional hobble. Um, so, yeah, I do a heap yeah, of so touch and go out in idea. the paddock and go... I'm getting the um, idea from you that you're really setting up a couple of exercises that really change the situation so that he knows things are different and, um, you, you know, you're trying mm -hmm. to change the pattern so that he can also, there's a bit more room for him to kind of um, work out a different response as well. So you've, um, th yep. with those couple of things to work on, um, I'm, I don't know, Stephanie, whether you've been to one of Mark's clinics or not. I'm just assuming that you haven't and you're completely new to Mark and you're completely new to his online training videos um you know she's found sort of a particular area that she needs to work on uh, can you just give her just a couple two or three of your key concepts that she, you also want her to take on board that's just really important with understanding how to help this horse well one of the biggest concepts that helps horses like him and uh is the concept of we don't drive our horses so um, when I'm working with horses, and this is one of the biggest things that people noticed uh, through this uh, tour in the US was how I don't use my energy. Uh, I'm just standing calm and I, I put a feel through a rope. I don't project my energy on the horses and stuff like that because these horses are so used to energy coming at them all the time from people and people pushing and trying to lunge and that's what makes them very defensive. So that's the first key you want to think about. The only energy that's going up to him with you is when you walk up to him with a big smile on your face and you touch him and go, you're my best friend and walk away. So that's the only energy that I'll have coming at a horse unless it was a special scenario and we're not going to go into that. But what I'm saying is I'm coming up to you to, to, to say I like you and then I'm going to go away. And, and just, 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 a, just an energy that your energy is safe. That's the, bit, that's the first concept. Don't try and use your energy to challenge him. Don't try and use your energy to push him away from your space. If he wants to, if he's going to come into your space like he's coming at you, you can do something big like a big clap or a, you can bang your legs, but that energy doesn't go at him. It just shocks him and says, that's my boundary, and then he'll step back, and then you just relax. Mm -hmm. So so the key thing mm -hmm. you've got to think about with a horse like him is don't come at him because uh, you'll trigger his aggression. Um the next biggest thing is you're trying to use uh, the things that the things that worry him to get him to move around is neutral, it's separate from you. So, you, as I said about the end, your energy doesn't connect with those things. So, when you pop a flag to get him to move away, something like that, you you you're just making that flag the worry, but you're just standing in the yard calm. So so he doesn't associate you and you and that flag as united and coming at him. Okay, so that's the other thing. Um, and basically, the rein, the rope that you put on his head, is the clarity that he needs to know what to do, where to stand, and not be confused. So some horses are standing there not knowing where they're supposed to be. So that's why I put a lot of intention through the lead. So once he starts to open up a little bit and he starts to kind of understand a few things, I don't want him to kind of bring his trouble to you and follow you around and things like that. I'd rather he just learns everything through that lead rope so he can let go of his worry a bit away from you. When that lead rope moves, he moves his thoughts and feet. When the lead rope stops, 
he stops his thoughts and feet. And, 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 um, and then he really trusts that lead rope so it's completely neutral and it's not personal. And that really helps those types of horses. And those are the concepts I try and teach people. Um, you know, we, we set our boundaries. We don't bring our boundaries to our horses. Um, and, yeah, we don't push them away. And, and, and that will help him feel a lot better. I hope that helps with you, Stephanie. Obviously, you've got a big task ahead of you, but as Mark says, it's um, it's not all bad and it can be fixed. So I think that's really helpful to hear, um, especially because Mark's using techniques that do help these kind of horses as opposed to the techniques that put them in this position in the first place, which obviously aren't going to have a great success rate. So um, thank you for coming on board. Thank you for um, taking a look into Mark and um, you know for giving this horse another shot. I think that's just amazing credit to you. We'll um, leave it there. We haven't got to the other questions, but we will, we've run out of time. So we'll, they'll be on next week. Um, so that's a horse that um, just will not take a step backwards. So again, this is um, one that's possibly shut down or um, we, I don't know. We'll find out from Mark. He'll, he'll know the insides on that one. Um, how to introduce a rug to horses that haven't had a lot of handling. That might be helpful to those of you who are in winter uh, this year, or, you know, that's a situation that more and more horses are rugged these days. And of course, a horse that runs back to the barn with its owner. So that particular horse has a different response to uh, the trainer, to its owner. Um, and I'm sure a lot of you have come across that scenario as well. So those are coming up next week and um, we'll leave it for there. Thank you so much, Mark. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you, everybody. You've been listening to Australia's very own Mark Langley a horseman with many insights from his decades of dabbling. Jump online to keep learning, marklangley.com.au.